It's a gentleman Gachowski show. Everybody, don't you know? Boom, boom, boom. It's a gentleman Gachowski show. Everybody, don't you know? It's a gentleman Gachowski show. <laughs> Welcome to another edition of the Gentleman Grachowski Show. I am Hen the Governor, and I have a special show for you tonight. For the whole half hour, we happen to have the producer and host of the long-running cable television program, Motorsports Unlimited. We got Bill Wilt. Welcome to the broadcast, Bill. Well, thank you. And I didn't hear what you said. What, what are you? I, I, huh? you? You muffed it just a little bit there. The Governor? The Governor? The Governor. Where does that come from? You know what? Uh, back when we, before I started the show, that's when people started calling me the Governor. People. Yeah, my friends and people around okay. me. Okay, all right, Governor. And, and you know, <laughs> you can't give yourself a nickname. I kind of liked it. Yeah. Well, Usually it's like fatty or, or, or there's yeah. skinny bones or something like that. The Governor, and this was 15 years ago, I'm like, yeah, that sounds pretty good. I can live with that. Yeah, well, they called me the Fuhrer. The and Fuhrer? I, and, oh, no. and, I, and I couldn't live with it. So. <laughs> <laughs> but, but uh, yeah, so once you get a nickname, and, and, I, and especially if you got one you like, you keep it. Yeah. And I try to, or I'll say Gentleman G sometimes. Okay. Because that right. kind of grows a little bit. Yeah, you sort of glossed over it. I missed exactly what you yeah. said. I didn't want to, uh, but go ahead, Governor. But yeah, but so uh, Motorsports Unlimited is the, is the program you've been producing for over 30 years. Over, was it 1,400 episodes? Over 1,400. 1,400 yeah, episodes. 1,400 and I think the last one was 1,411 Masters. Wow. Yeah. That's, that's a, definitely an accomplishment. And the question I have for you is, why do guys like fast, loud cars? Uh, I think it's, I, I'm not so sure if the loud is important, but at least uh, for people like me, uh, it's just uh, instinctive in us. From the time I was a little kid, I can remember the first time, uh, I'm originally from upstate New York. Well, I mean, I was, I was, uh, I was born in Pittsfield, Massachusetts, but I lived in Maine too. But the bulk of my years before 12 years old, I lived in upstate New York, and they used to have county fairs. It was the country part of New York, not Manhattan or anything, the country part. And uh, the county fair would come through and they have a thing called the Hell Drivers. And the parents would take us there and I was just fascinated by the cars going around the track and all that. And then when I got a little bit older, my sister, who was five years older than me, uh, took me one time to the Sharon Springs Raceway. That was a close okay. little town and uh, they had a stock car track there. And I mean, I could have spent my life there. I was so just enthralled with it. And I kind of thought, this will probably strike you as funny, but I kind of thought, all young guys do that. I found out later in life, <laughs> they don't. Right. But, but it sort of surprised me because everybody I knew, me and all of my friends, we were always fascinated with cars and making them go faster and building engines and all that sort of thing. And between myself and my friends, that's what we did. Uh, and then it was, I can almost tell you when it happened, I got a job with United Airlines and for the first time, uh, I'm in a ready room with about 100 guys, all young guys. And it turns out there were only five or six of us that were gearheads. The rest of them were like normal people. Normal, so, okay. Yeah, so I, I found out everybody wasn't like that. But I thought in my younger years, all young. In fact, my dad used to say, this, oh, you'll grow out of that. All young guys are like yeah. that. I never grew out of it. But was there something specific you liked about it? Everything. The engine sounds, uh, the mechanical workings. I'm fascinated by machinery. I, I always have been. Uh, my mother used to say, and again, I'm taking her word for it, that as a child, my favorite toy was a percolator. If you remember what those were, those were, that's how people made coffee. Right, okay. And it had a glass thing on the top that the thing right, would percolate okay. into. Well, but it was a series of pieces. And for some reason, as a three-year-old, I delighted in taking it apart and putting it together and all that so it was just for me it was normal see i'm just the opposite once it's together i don't even want to touch it i don't oh, no, want to, no. i don't i'm not a gear like a gearhead where i want to figure out what's everything about i want to know how I everything works part. i want to know how everything works and how i can make it better and it, did you do uh, have any creations on the percolator that you uh you get mom upset about did you uh, do anything to it no not really in fact uh, they at that time they were encouraging it although later they would try the discouraging but at that time they were they didn't realize what it was going to lead to you know were you drinking the coffee too or just uh, no it? you know what interesting enough i i don't drink coffee and never have you just liked the the, the mechanics I just like the mechanics of the percolator because so many pieces that went together okay what life events made you want to produce a television show about motorsports well, the, the, quite frankly, our, our sport is dying, and okay. I had great concerns about it. I became aware, I've always been involved with motorsports. Uh, from the time I had my first motorcycle, I went to my first official drag race, meaning not a street race, but my official right. drag race at the old Oswego Dragway uh, with a motorcycle. And I became aware that uh, in 1953, there were more than 2,500 racetracks in this country. And at that time, we had fewer than 800. So it was obvious we were losing them at a, at a very high rate. And I had great concerns about that. So 
I looked at it and studied it, and it became kind of an obsession in life to find out why. What are we missing? What's wrong here? Why are we losing these tracks, and why are fewer and fewer people involved with this? And I became aware, you have to remember, I'm 73 years old now, and I was born in 1943. So okay. I remember before there was television. Right. And I've watched television change our country in every way. And motorsport was omitted from television. We had no part in it. Uh, at the very beginning, the only sports on television typically was baseball, because baseball was slow moving and the uh, camera equipment and all that at that time. I'm talking about the early and mid 50s. Okay. Camera equipment was large and bulky and slow moving and needed a lot of light. So a baseball game and the daylight was something they could photograph well. So that was kind of included a lot on television, whereas motorsports uh, wasn't. Okay. Uh, as I became aware that there's a reason that our community is diminishing, and it has to do with television, I said, somehow I've got to get my community on television. And, and if I boiled it down to a few words over time that what I was trying to do was raise public consciousness, understanding, and appreciation of the motorsport community and their activities. And the only way you can do that in America is by television. Thus, I used, I mean, my, my original intent, yeah, it still may be that way. It was I wanted to sue ABC, NBC, and CBS, and the FCC for misuse of the public airwaves because I didn't have access to them. Right. And when I stumbled on cable television came along and it was new, and I'm looking at it and I kept hearing this word, public access. I said, what is that? I'm public. I don't have access. Well, public access cable, you do have access. And that's when I started pressing for it. So it wasn't that I had any interest in a television career or anything like that. It was, I wanted to get my community on the air. I wanted to get the public familiar with them and, and hopefully develop an appreciation for what they do. And the thing is, back in the day, you were talking about there was not, there was not much sports. There was not much, much on television when you were growing up. Right. As you, were, you started a show in the, in the 80s? Uh, 86. 86. 86, yeah. Was, wasn't uh, like NASCAR bigger at that time? No. It, they, in fact, you might find it interesting because a lot of people have asked me that. Said, Bill, why do you keep doing it? Because there's a lot of that on the air. I said, well, first of all, two things. Uh, there's not a lot of what I do on the air. And just briefly, I'll get back to that. But briefly, what I do is I have a motorsport program for people who don't give a darn about motorsports. Those are the people I want to talk to. That I don't, don't care about it. That don't care about it. Okay. I, I don't do the show for the gearheads. It's not technical enough for that. And quite frankly, we already know how wonderful we are. We don't need to be convinced. <laughs> no, it's true. We don't need to be convinced. Right. But the tolerance of the public is important to us because those are the ones that get the racetracks closed and all of the rest of it. So it's really important to our community that people have an appreciation for what we do and why we do it. Now you talk about NASCAR. When cable first came along, there was no motorsport on television. The only thing that we had was a delayed tape coverage of the Indy 500. Okay. Cable was looking for something to put on the air, and they ended up making a deal with NASCAR, with ESPN, of putting NASCAR. But this didn't come the first few years. This came four or five years after cable came into existence. So they started putting NASCAR in the air. It got to be very popular. Eventually, NASCAR moved to network television and all that. But when cable started, none of it was on the air, none of it at all. And then, as your as your program came on here, you know, just right after the the, the ESPN. Well, started. yeah. What, uh, again, and that wasn't what I was looking for. Uh, boy, this is really complicated. I'll take as little time as I can. But if you don't understand, stop me, and I'll be glad to. I've explained it so many times over the years. Uh, my concern isn't whether they cover a race or not. I don't care about that. Okay. What my concern is is that every day, many times a day, we have a thing called news. We have the morning news, the noon news, the afternoon news, the evening news, yeah. the early news, the late news. We have news. And every one of these news programs has a sports segment. Right. And the sports segment is the Cubs, the Bears, the White Sox, the Cubs, the Bears, the White Sox, the Cubs, the Bears, the right. White Sox. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, wait a minute. They're not the only competitors in the sports entertainment marketplace. Okay. We also have in this area, we did, they're all gone now, but we had Santa Fe Speedway and Raceway Park and O'Hare Stadium. We had a number of motorsport facilities never covered. So I can't tell you how it graded me the wrong way. Was, well, that's it in sports. Never mentioned. There, there's the still a lot more in sports that they could have been filed, especially local stuff. Because you said that how many, 
How many local tracks were there when you, in the 40s when you... No, no, I'm not talking about the 40s. I'm talking about in the 50s when yeah. television came along. We had, like I say, for, you probably don't even know. Do you know we had a track right here on Mannheim Road called O'Hare Stadium? No. Yeah, O'Hare Stadium, just a little south of Irving Park Road on Mannheim Road. I raced there for several years. It was there, I think they closed about 1968, something like that. And, of course, Santa Fe Speedway. Santa Fe Speedway operated as a motorsport facility from 1953 up until close to 2000 when they shut down. But that particular facility was in business since 1890s, since the 1890s. Okay. In fact, it's called Santa Fe Speedway because it's right next to the Santa Fe line. And it used to be people took the train out from Chicago okay. and got off at Santa Fe Park. And they had dances there and picnics and things like that. Okay. And they eventually built the, well, the track was originally a horse racing track, and they changed it to uh, uh, cars and, and motorcycles on Wednesday nights. In fact, that's one of the... Uh, I'll give you an example of what the problem was as I saw it because I, I wanted some evidence and some proof. Uh, my wife was still alive at the time, so one day I, I told her, I said, we're going to take a survey, and Woodfield Mall had just opened. It was, okay. it was brand new. And I picked Woodfield Mall because geographically it was kind of centrally located, about the same distance to go to Comiskey Park and Wrigley Field and Santa Fe Speedway and Raceway Park, all about the same distance. And I would my wife, I put on a tie and got a clipboard. My wife was well dressed and went to Woodfield. And I asked 104 people the following four questions. I prefaced it by saying, I'm not asking you if you like these things or if you've ever gone to these things or if you have any interest in them. I'm just asking if you've ever heard of them. Are you aware of them? First question Are you aware of or have you heard of the Chicago Cubs in Wrigley Field? Okay. I'm Second sure obviously question. they all said yes. Yeah. Second yeah. question, are you aware of or are you conscious of Comiskey Park and Chicago White Sox? Third question, are you aware of or conscious of Soldier Field and the Chicago Bears? Final question, are you aware there's a motorsport facility in the Chicagoland area that has had professional motorcycle racing every Wednesday night for 50 years? Okay. Now, how do you think that survey went? Probably not good, at least for motorsports. Yeah. Almost everybody knew about the Cubs and the Bears and the White Sox. And other than a couple of people gave me a hard time, there was one or two that said, gee, I think I heard a commercial or something, but nobody was really aware of it. Now I ask you, how can a competitor in the sports entertainment marketplace possibly compete if in the geographic area in which they operate, no one has ever heard of them? No, I understand, yeah. How can you possibly compete? So the question that I've been asking and have been asking now on the air for 30 years and prior to that I've been doing it for 50 years. Who gets to use the public airwaves and for what purpose? That's really the question. Who gets to air use these airwaves right. and for what purpose? When you think about it, the airwaves have the power to select our, natives, na uh, our nation's leadership. Mm -hmm. The airwaves have the power to determine which products will succeed and which products won't. Who gets to use them? You would think everybody would have the opportunity. Do you get to use them? Well, I'm, I'm using it now. No, you're not. This is public access cable. That's not okay. the airwaves. Who gets, well, the, the who airwaves, gets right. to use the airwaves and for what purpose? Okay. Seems to me it's a legitimate, a legitimate question. We all ought to be asking. It has such enormous power. Literally, I'll go further than that. If you have time enough for my complete argument on this, you have to understand that it literally influences every opinion that you have. Now the question is, who gets to do this? His phone, he's trying to hide that his phone is ringing. <laughs> he forgot to turn his phone off. There you go. You're not going to take the call, are you? No. no. <laughs> Anyhow, do you understand my line of thought? You know, the question is, we've got this incredible, powerful entity in our midst, and I watched it happen. As I said, I was born in 1943, so I saw television come into being. I remember well laying on the living room floor with the big Zenith radio, and my brother and I laying on the floor listening to the radio. Dad sitting there reading the newspaper next to the radio, and my mother darning the socks. I right. still remember the, do you know what a darning egg is? No. It's a wooden thing that's shaped like an egg, but you put it in a sock. So you can kind of, if you get a hole in the sock, you can weave new material out of it without pulling the material together and making a knot. Oh, okay. It's actually a way of weaving material over the egg, which is kind of the shape of a, a foot in the sock. It's called a darning egg. Oh, okay. And I still remember my mother sitting there with the darning egg and doing those kind of things. So I've watched television change us in right. every way, in every way. And I'm standing back here and I'm saying, hey, what about my community? Right. Why are we left out? Why are we left out? 
I could go further and say, I am not surprised. You may be aware we've lost the auto industry. The American auto industry used to be the darling of the world. Our, right. our auto, you know, we've lost the auto industry, but I'm not surprised. I'm really not surprised. We have taken our attention and directed it towards, you know, when you think about all the billions of dollars that spent, not just on ticket prices, but paraphernalia and everything on things like the, and, and believe me, I enjoy watching the Bears, but things like the Bears and the White Sox and things like that. We really squandered money on these things, and yet we get nothing out of it except frivolous entertainment. Now, I will grant you that frivolous entertainment can be important. I mean, we all like a little distraction in life, right. but it should be the focus of our society. Yeah, I would, I would, I, so. I, I would suggest that, that there are other things that are, that are important. And uh, my concern always is when you turn it, for example, I'm sure you know who Walter Payton is. Okay, yes. Ernie Banks? Mm -hmm. you know who, Ernie, do you know who Tony Izzo is? No. The unparalleled, unprecedented, nine times Santa Fe Speedway track champion. Nine times. Nine times, yet yeah, you've never heard of him. No. Isn't that interesting? Now, do you think it's because we're, we're up north? Do you think in the south, no, more sports? No, the, the, it's no different. In fact, we sometimes get a misimpression. That I've, I've, I kind of laugh a little bit about the whole NASCAR thing because there are people who kind of think NASCAR invented stock racing. They didn't. There was stock racing all over the country. There was in the northeast where I lived in upstate New York. There was stock racing all over the country. What NASCAR essentially did was they organized it regionally. All of the other tracks around the country, each one of them operated individually without cooperation. In fact, they fought most of the time with each other. And along comes a guy named Bill France, the original Bill France, who's passed away uh, long ago now. And here's a big, tough guy uh, that the, the, who was also a driver, and the drivers respected him and all that. And he was determined to organize stock car racing in a regional fashion so that the cars could go to this track and that track and that track and to try to make this sport more acceptable. But we've had motorsports in this entire country since the very, since the very first automobile, for the very first automobiles invented, uh, we raced them. In fact, okay. you, might, you might be interested to know, I don't know if you know this, or not, do you know where the first automobile race in America was held? Uh, do not know. Right here in Chicago, Thanksgiving Day, 1895. So Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving Day, 1895, and the thing that was, uh, was important about it was at that time, we didn't know about automobiles in this country, we knew nothing about it, and the editor and publisher of the Chicago Times-Herald made a trip to France two years earlier to the world's first automobile race from Paris to Bordeaux. Okay. And he was so impressed with these contraptions, and they were just contraptions, he was so impressed with these contraptions and the number that they had, when he came back to this country, he says, I think, I think that's the future. Now, what can I do with my newspaper to encourage what they call the, the, the inventors in our country to work on these contraptions? Okay. So he came up with the idea of having a race. And originally his idea was to have it from Milwaukee to Chicago, and that's, it was too hard. There's too many counties and state lines and all that kind of right. stuff. So then he changed the plan, and it's going to be from uh, uh, Chicago to Waukegan and back. And I won't go through the whole story because it's, it's a lengthy thing. But what it finally ended up being is that we are going to have this race uh, from on Thanksgiving Day uh, from Chicago to Evanston and back. The important thing, there was a lot of important things about it, but one of the most important things about it was the winner of the race, the Durier, one year later became the first production company in America. The Durier was the first automobile company in America one year after the race because he had won the race and got a lot of attention. Okay. And five years later, by 1900, because of this event, we had over 200 automobile manufacturers in America. Wow. So this race was very, very important because it kicked off an interest in these contraptions and development in these contraptions. And those are the old cars that were, didn't have roofs, right? They didn't have, these were literally buckboards that had yeah. an engine on the back. Uh, these these were, were nothing that you would recognize as an automobile. Tell us about how you came up with the, with the title of the show, Motorsports Unlimited. Well, I'd like to say that I came up with it, but I didn't. No. As a matter of fact, I was friends with a, with a fellow named Walter Modelski, who was a guy that did Formula Atlantic Racing, and he became the first show that we did on Motorsports Unlimited. It was about Walter Modelski's Formula Atlantic uh, car. And, uh, and we were friends, and we, we had been discussing. I said, what can I call this show? What can I call it? And blah, 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 blah. And, after a while, because I said, no, I said, I want to have everything. I want airplanes on there, I want snowmobiles on there, I want boats on there and everything. So he said, well, why not just Motorsports Unlimited? I said, huh. yeah, okay. I think Very that simple. works. Let's go Motorsports Very Unlimited. And yeah, it, and it, it's, it's all inclusive. Yeah. yeah. What are the challenges of producing a show on location weekly? Um, 
Well, the, for me, without question, the most difficult part was always rounding up the girls. You may or may not be aware, aware that Motorsports Unlimited is always known as the show with the girls with the feathers. And yeah. It's a wonderful hook that has been working perfectly over the years. And as much as I like it that way, it triples my work having the girls on the show. <laughs> um, just, as you can see, anytime you deal with other people, yeah, there's always reliability problems and all. Oh, it phone makes, calls. It, oh, it makes <laughs> it phone. It makes it crazy. It absolutely makes it crazy. And uh, without a doubt, rounding up the girls every week was. I felt sorry for my poor wife. She was in charge of that. And, yeah. and if, it, if it hadn't been for her, we couldn't have done it. But she was in charge of that every week to, is to round up the girls. And again public access television, nobody gets paid, everybody's a volunteer, so it's not like you can cut somebody's check off, you know, you, yeah. you, you know you're, you're, you're determined to get the volunteers out there and accommodate them. I mean, I can't tell you the number of times I've driven a half an hour to pick up a girl for the show because uh -huh. I needed her for the show. Right. Do you remember your first episode? Yeah, I do. Well, I, you know, I said that Walter Moldowski's uh, car was a, a yeah. criminal land car, and it was the first episode. However, there's a little caveat in there that before we did that episode, as we were planning it uh, they asked me to do a presentation to the Chicagoland Sports Car Club and okay. I put together a whole thing about what I saw the problems of why we were losing the racetracks and all that and I put together a whole presentation and a friend of mine said he wanted to tape it which he did but it wasn't it wasn't with three quarter inch or anything we've been using then he was using a camcorder kind of a thing but after he did it I looked at it and I says you know now with this public access thing I can actually put that on the air so I did a little editing on that but I don't like to say that was the first one because I didn't shoot it, and you know what I mean. It was just it was just by chance. But actually, officially, that was Motorsports Unlimited's uh, first episode. But the first real episode that we planned to put together was Walt Modelski's Formula Atlanta car. And this, and then did it go smooth? Oh no, we, we, <laughs> we, were, we were using the Westchester studio, and we thought we had it all planned out and everything was measured. And I don't have to tell you that the car wouldn't fit in the studio. Oh, jeez. <laughs> oh, yeah. And fortunately, they had a little parking lot in the uh, back of the place. So we left the big doors up and rolled the camera out. There you and, go. And, you know, you do what you have to do. And that's not the first time that that's happened to me. I remember we did a show in Chicago. We were using the Chicago Access Studio. We did a show about uh, uh, boat racing. Uh, Ray Lumbert, who one of the top boat racers in the country and he's right out here from I think he's from Lombard and uh, so he comes down they come down with their boats and the advantage of the Chicago Access Studio is they've got two big eight foot wide eight foot high doors entering the place from street level so we could get this equipment I had airplanes in there one time oh, wow yeah and so we we're all set we open the doors and we're going to bring them in and there's no way the boats won't go in the studio I says that can't be the, the law on the highway is the trailer can't be wider than eight feet so I know it's going to fit right and it, well, their trailers were almost nine feet wide. He said, yeah, we just hope nobody notices. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> so you run into all these kinds. So we end up shooting that program in the, just outside the door we that entered the studio. But you do what you have to do, you know. Yeah. How do hot women and, and fast cars go together so well? I think it's because motorsports is predominantly a young male sport. And young males are full of hormones and uh, they love fast cars, as you characterized them earlier, fast, loud cars and yeah. pretty girls. It's, it's just part of our lives. It's just the things that makes young males go. And it was difficult to get the women ready for the shoots. Oh, it was, it, it was not a matter of ready for the shoots. It's a matter, it's the reliability. And I'm not the only one that's had that, that trouble. Well, first of all, I can kind of understand it because, again, public access television, nobody gets paid. Everybody's a volunteer. So it's a little hard to be real demanding. And yet, for television, you have to be demanding. You can't start whenever you feel like it. You've got to, we're ready to go. Yeah. And, and, uh, but I've known many people who've had restaurants and they had problems with waitresses too as far as reliability and all that sort of thing. It's just, it's, I, it's one of the things over the years, and I've taken my share of criticism about the girls and all that, and that's fine. I'm more than happy to explain that. But uh, you might be surprised, and you're probably not old enough to know it yet, but men and women are different. <laughs> And what gives you that idea? Well, with a woman, <laughs> I will tell you right now, if her child has a sniffle, that's the most important thing in her life. She's not going to work. She's not that, yeah. that, 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 a man. It's going to work. Right. <laughs> you know, it's we just we think differently. Our priorities are different, and you just have to accommodate. Because without the motorsport girls, I don't have a show, and I know it. Now you produced a new show for 14 years straight without a rerun. Without a rerun. How <laughs> stressful is that to, to do? Uh, it really is. I, the one that I probably remember the best is because I was married to a Russian girl at the time, and she said it with that strong Russian ac accent. We we're supposed to do a snowmobile show, and unfortunately, we had like four days of 
60 degree weather. There wasn't any snow left. We had six inches of water. It was raining like mm. crazy. And we still had to shoot the program anyway. How do you shoot it? She called it a rainmobile program. Okay. <laughs> it was, but those are the kind of things you go through. That regardless of the weather conditions, whether we have blizzards or heat or whatever, we shoot. Right. And the audience understood it, right? Yeah, they do understand it. I, at least I've never had any people complain about it. I know those weren't the greatest shows in the world that we shot, but one way or the other, we, we've got to shoot. Now, what's the secret to your success for 30 years of Motorsports Unlimited? Well, I'm not sure how you measure success. You're able to put it together. You're yeah, able but, to but, air it for 30 yeah, years. Yeah, it's been on the air for 30 years, and yet I haven't achieved anything near what I wanted to accomplish. And I would suggest to you, since I started, we've lost Santa Fe Speedway. We lost Raceway Park. We lost O'Hare Stadium. We lost uh, US 30 Drag Strip. Uh, we've just lost um, um, uh, Ileana. Uh, these are all these are all fights that I had hoped Motorsports Unlimited would save these places, and we'd be able to continue with motorsports. And yet, in the time that I've been on here, we've lost these things. So I don't consider that very successful. So I'm not sure how you measure success. You'd have to define that a little bit for me. Now, before we leave, you, you brought a video clip from your archives. Yeah. You know, you you've been producing all these shows, over 1,400 of them, mm -hmm. and you're 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 bringing flashbacks back into the shows as, as the, your recent shows. You're just, mm -hmm. and it's amazing how good, and crisp, and clear everything looks. And it, it looks like it was shot on film, you know, even though it was videotape. I, I you, was, took, you preserved it really well. Well, I'm very lucky. I had a man named Chuck Itzenthaler that uh, worked with us for 18 years as my cameraman. Okay. And he was excellent. Chuck is a very bright guy. He had no knowledge. He didn't know anything about photography when he started, but he had the one advantage that you really need for television. He's smart. Yeah. And he picked things up. The technology was not a, a, a... In fact, I started using him with the program because we were starting to shoot some bands, and I wanted him to do the audio on it. And I quickly became aware of how sharp this guy was. And he was a real asset to the show for 18 years. Let's take a quick look at this video clip you brought from okay. uh, Channel 2 News. There are a few limits to what TV producers will try these days to get people to watch. But in Schaefer's place, Mark reports on a show done right here in Chicago that uses an old-fashioned gimmick to draw a crowd of viewers. Yeah, can you bring it over? No. At a cable TV studio downtown Chicago, they're getting ready to shoot a segment of Motorsports Unlimited, arguably the most watched cable TV show in Chicago. Hi, I'm Subi Etzenthaler. Appearing on nine cable systems in the area, I'm Denise, and welcome to... On most systems, it's seen four times a week with such blockbuster topics as new advances in fuel injection technology mm -hmm. and the advantages of a stroked crank 484 with steel lifters. Hi, I'm Chris Schutz. The reason this motorsports show is so popular is the star. I'm Bill Wilt, and we want to welcome you to Motorsports Unlimited. Park this cable TV show that features that muscle cars and mannequins, like show, live uh, ones, very, very and they cool. are what so everyone's watching. Little, uh... You're the guy that has that show with those girls with the feathers. <laughs> they don't know his name or the name of the show, but they recognize the feathers. That's right. Instantly. So it's kind of like you are the stars, in a way. Sure. Listen, this is a great car, but I'm going to tell you something. We're going to have to move. We're going to have to walk around behind the uh, car, and I'll explain it as we go. Just go ahead and walk around there. See, I get uh, angry letters from viewers if we block the girls. So <laughs> Often interviews are done way in the back of the studio while the cameras get shots of the cars from interesting angles. And car. they sometimes stay on Better those shots for a long time. They certainly do. It's campy, it's dated, it's unbelievable, and it's absolutely mesmerizing. The hour-long show is a low-budget cable access production. Everyone's a volunteer. Bill, the star, helps in all phases of production. No detail escapes his attention. Or should that be, no important detail escapes his attention. How can I get folks to watch our little public access show when they all have a remote control in their hand and they can go to Channel 2 like that? Nothing attracts attention like a pretty girl. Motorsports Unlimited is a show that knows its audience. Is it rolling? Okay. Girls, arch your backs, puff up, big one smiles. Everybody look at camera two, big smile. Mark Schaefer, Channel 2 News. From Motorsports Unlimited, thanks for stopping by the show. Maybe you can come by again, because I had a whole bunch of questions I had for you, and I only got to like three or four. You gave me a list of ten pages, you didn't yeah, get to the third I, one. I, I, oh, I just, because <laughs> you, you definitely, you know, you got a lot to say, and it's yeah. definitely, it's, it's definitely, uh, Motorsports Unlimited, uh, what's the website? Uh, msutv at aol.com if you want to email me or msutv.com for the website. I'm sure everyone out there has watched the show before, but definitely it's still on the air and definitely keep looking because this is a, a treasure right here. <laughs> a, a cable television treasure in the Chicagoland area. Bill, Thank well, you. thanks for stopping by the broadcast. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.